Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for Bee Chicas, Native Bees and Their Habitats. I am Kathy Lane, Programs, Events and Outreach Coordinator with the Boulder Public Library. And Shannon Kincaid is behind the scenes running the live stream. Before we begin, I will briefly cover some housekeeping while we watch a video of our library native bee house. So this event is being recorded and will be available on Boulder Public Library's YouTube channel and the Seed to Table playlist after today. All of our events are online. All of our online events are an extension of library services and library conduct of policies apply in our online space. Please visit our website at boulderlibrary.org for a full events calendar, including seed to table events that focus on sustainable living with gardening, cooking, and Bee Chica programs. I'd like to thank the Boulder Library Foundation for its generous sponsorship of this and so many of our events. Finally, if at any time during the event, you can post your questions in the chat by logging into your Google, YouTube, or Facebook account. The Bee Chicas will answer questions after the 30 minute presentation on native bees. And the Boulder Public Library and City of Boulder have been working with the Bee Chicas since 2015 for seat to table workshops. You might see them from the Boulder Creek path, taking care of the library beehives on the main library roof in their colorful beekeeping suits. The Bee Chicas are also volunteer coordinators for Pollinator Appreciation Month and the Boulder Bee Festival. Visit their website, beechicas.com, for resources, recipes, and videos. So now I would like to introduce the Bee Chicas on screen with me here. We have Teresa Beck, Cynthia Scott, Deborah Foy, and Tracy Bell Humor. The Bee Chicas are artists, gardeners, beekeepers, scientists, and pollinator advocates. So Bee Chicas, thank you yet again for adapting an in-person workshop as an online experience. And Cynthia will begin with an overview of native bees in Colorado. Thank you, Kathy. We're so happy to be here and, and glad all of you can join us today to talk about native bees. So first I'm gonna do a quick overview about native bees in Colorado. And then Teresa is going to talk about how you can host the bees in your own yards or backyards or patios. And, um, and then Deborah and Tracy are going to talk about making places for native bees, like bee houses. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, resources that you might need. And then, um, and then we'll open it up to some questions. So... Let's get started. So they keep finding more and more native bees in Colorado and we're up to almost 1000 different species and they're still counting. So we have so many of native bees that we can only do a really brief overview. And um, most of our native bees nest in the ground, but about 30% nest in cavities. And so we're gonna show you some of each of those. And, um, and unlike honeybees, which are very social creatures that have a queen and a caste system, most of our native bees are, almost all of them are solitary. So next slide. I also wanted to shout out a big thank you to the CU Museum of Natural History and Virginia Scott and Adrian Carper, because that's where we've learned so much information that we know about native bees and we've actually borrowed some of their photos also for this presentation. So we thank them so much for that. So this is a, a mason bee, the Osmia lignaria and the Osmia ribiflorus and many others. There's 76 kinds. These are gonna be the bees that you might see the earliest in the spring coming out. Um, sometimes they come out too early and Tracy's gonna talk about that a little bit. They're a major pollinator for fruit trees and a hundred times more effective than honeybees. So those are beautiful Osnia. Next slide. These are Megachylae or leaf cutting bees. These are another favorite of ours. Um, you, we can tell if we have leaf cutting bees in our yard. Even if you don't see the bee, you might see leaves like those rose leaves in Deborah's garden. 
um, that are like a work of art that an artist, Ms. Delise Cutter B, is cutting a perfect little piece to use it as wallpaper for her nesting tunnel. And they line it with the, um, with the petals and make individual cells as most of the solitary cavity nesters, as you can see in that picture, they make a cell and they put a, a blob of pollen and lay an egg on it. And then they cap off that cell, the leaf cutters with the leaf, the mason bees with mud, and then they line up their um, babies in their tunnel side by side. And this picture with the um, on the right hand side with the pink flower is uh, the abdomen of a leaf cutter bee. You can spot these in your garden because they have scopa on under at the underside of their abdomen where they collect pollen, and that's just that what you see that big yellow blob is just a bunch of pollen, which makes them very effective pollinators because they collect a lot of pollen intentionally and unintentionally all over their hairy bodies. So next slide. Amphidium, our wool carter bees are really fun to watch and you'll see them, you might see a battle of the bees in your own backyard if you have Amphidium. They guard their plants and I've seen little tanks trying to keep the honeybees off of their um, lamb's ears because they, they're very territorial. And they're called wool carter bees because they actually scrape the fuzz off of the leaf of the plant and use that as their nesting material. Next slide. And then I wanted to point out a teeny tiny cavity nesting bee, the Hylaea or the yellow-faced bee. These bees are as small as your little pinky fingernail. They're teeny tiny and that flower on the right hand side is a sweet alyssum and those are such a tiny flower. The bee looks large on that teeny little flower but it's really not. Um, they love cavity nest um, bee blocks with cavities cut in them and um, but they use the teeny tiny holes. If you see an eighth of an inch or even a one sixteenth of an inch hole, you will see a tiny cellophane um, or silk plug and that will be the indication of the hyleus. And they're such tricky little things. They're so small that they can go and grab pollen off of a flower, like you see in that middle photo, without touching the rest of the plant. So they're actually not pollinating. They're just grabbing that pollen, collecting it and flying to the next plant. So they're, they're a little bit of a tricky little creature, but they're, they're fun to see and they're teeny tiny. Great, next slide. So what we found was so fun with our um, project with the bees needs is that Virginia Scott knows that the way you can tell who's nesting in your bee block is by the nest plug that they put out. So here we've matched the bee to the nest plug. So you can see, for instance, the mason bee uses mud plugs or chewed leaf plugs. And so even if you don't see the bee, you can just look at your bee block and see what bees you have. And over to the right of that blue line, I've got two species of wasps listed there. Uh, you will commonly see these two wasps nesting in your bee block, even though they're not bees. And they're, but they're also wonderful creatures to watch. The Isodontia wasp, Virginia calls the gentle giant. And she also says, if you see these flying, you'll see them with a bunch of grass um, stems or twigs in her um, carrying as she flies. And she looks like a little witch on a broomstick flying in. And they are large, they're like an inch or inch and a half long. Whereas the aphid wasp, which is the other teeny tiny one is, very small like the Hylaeus bee will nest in the tiniest um, bee plug, um, the tiniest cavities that you provide. So we couldn't go into very much detail, but um, those are some of the common things that you might see um, around here in cavities. So we also have some ground nesters that everyone loves, the bumblebees. There's 23 different species in Boulder County. And those are some of the first bees that you'll see flying and they'll be the enormous queens. These bees are not solitary. They are primitively social, which, which means that the queen overwinters by herself in the ground and comes out in the spring and does all of the work to build up her nest. 
um, by herself. And then when her first babies become bees, they will then also become queens and they nest next to each other. And just to point out those, there's four bees on this slide that have um, orange bands and they are all different bees. So you have to look very closely to distinguish which bee is, is which. The middle one, I, I believe, is the hunty eye, which is one of the most common ones that we see um, in Boulder. And then the one on the far right is um, a giant bumblebee that you know, just sounds like a lawnmower coming up behind your head, um, Nevadensis. And they are wonderful, big, beautiful bees that you'll likely see also around here. So next slide. The sweat bee is another favorite. We see so many different kinds. There's 89 species of these sweat bees in Colorado. And sweat bees are also primitively social and they do the same process of having a queen over winter. And um, these are also ground nesters. They nest in um, deep um, holes, sometimes a yard deep, three feet into underground is where they'll nest. And so they can stay alive during the winter because it's um, they're below frost level. And they're beautiful to see in the garden. They come in all different shapes and sizes, but the ones that, that are easy to spot are the bright green ones like that one over on that coneflower on the far right in Deborah's garden. You can see they're very small, they're only about half an inch. Some of them are bigger than others, but um, that's, that's a, a beautiful little jewel to look for. Next slide. And we couldn't talk about native bees without talking about squash and gourd bees. These are specialist bees, which means they only pollinate one type of plant. They will go to wild or cultivated spot squash plants only. And a good thing to know about these sweet bees is that they nest in the ground right under their host plants, which is the squash plants. So if you're gardening with squash and you see some of these bees, be careful not to till around or, or um, dig up the dirt when you pull up those squash plants for the next season because the bees are, will be nesting there. They nest about one to one and a half feet below the surface. And so um, just, just do some light tilling around those plants if you uh, want to keep your bees happy. Next slide. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, we have a lot of, of information on our website, beechicas.com, and Tracy made this great little bee zine, and you can go to our website, print it out, and she has a video on how to fold it, and you'll have a little pocket guide to take with you when you go out in your yard to remember what bees you're looking for. So thanks for that, Tracy. And and now I'd like to um, turn it over to Teresa, who's going to talk a lot more about how, how to host the bees in your own backyard. Hi there. So we're going to start out with forage, which means flowers, beautiful flowers, and with the food and the water that they're going to need. Um, it's good to provide bees with a source for water if you want to attract them um, to nest in the area. And sometimes we put out little flat um, dishes with pebbles in it and put water, or sometimes you You'll see them around water features. Um, we really think it's important to plant natives um, because that'll attract native bees. All the bees that Cynthia just talked about, some of them are specialists and they're only gonna go to a certain native flowers. So it's really great to plant Colorado natives. And then in our gardens, we have neglected corners. And our friend, um, Andrea, who is a Goss Grove, um, advocate for uh, neighborhood pollinator pockets around Boulder, but in the Goss Grove area, she says, messy is mighty. That's one of her quotes. And so she recommends, we recommend having piles of wood around or leave some leaves or leave some bare ground. Don't mulch everything because that will encourage minor bees and digger bees to nest in your gardens. So um, also the um, Tracy and Deborah are gonna talk about bee houses uh, in a little bit to try to um, show you how to, make, how to make an easy bee house. Okay, next slide. And now we're gonna talk about habitat. 
in a video coming. So this is a goldenrod, um, which is a native Colorado plant, Sol, Sol, Sol Diego. Uh, Sol Diego. <laughs> and if you see behind, there is a there was a pot of black-eyed Susans, because if you don't have an extensive garden like this, you can also put um, flowers and perennials in pots to attract native uh, pollinators. This is blanket flower. And look how it's massed. If you have the area, it's nice to like put three to five plants in or more if you can, because the bees love to go to masses of areas to get their nectar and their pollen. And um, that garden area, as you see, the, the lawn had bare spots in it. And it's really important to leave some bare grounds uh, areas for, for the nesting um, solitary bees that nest in the ground. This is catmint. It's not a native plant. There's yarrow there too, but the bees love it. You can see that there's so many. Um, and these is a this is a buzzing bumblebee that Cynthia talked about, and it's doing something called buzz pollinating, and it disengages its flight, um, it, its wings from its flight muscles, and it shakes its whole body, and that. Um, makes a frequency that's about like the uh, middle C in a musical note, and it releases the pollen from the flower and uh, makes it a much more effective pollinator. So look at those pollen pockets on, on their legs. They're just packed with pollen. And that's an annual larkspur. This is a little sweat bee. Um, and it is so tiny, you're gonna see that they're, the honeybee is so much bigger. Um, but uh, this is a, a wonderful little native bee as well. And uh, look at this leaf cutter bee. Um, you remember that Cynthia was talking about the round shapes cut out by the, by the leaf cutter. They actually carry those leaves in their legs and to their nests to plug up their nesting blocks, uh, cavities in the nesting block. And dandelions are super spring food for all natives and honeybees because they have both nectar and pollen. So we talk about making meadows and not lawns by populating our lawns with um, not only dandelions, which is easy to populate with, but by planting bulbs and um, different flowering pollinator ground covers in our in our lawns. And you might have seen this sweet pea that is all over the foothills. Um, I don't know if it's a native, but um, it is prolific and the bees love it. And so this is another little leaf cutter bee on that uh, sweet pea. And here is the squash bee <laughs> that Cynthia was talking about. It's a longhorn uh, bee, and you can see the really long antennas. And one thing that they do nest underneath the plants, but also the males tend to sleep in the flowers at night. And then those flowers close up. And in the morning, a female will visit that flower and he'll be the first to greet her. And um, this is the uh, minor bee. Um, it's an and Andrina, and they like sunny areas so that they can, you know, get in there and and dig and burrow. Um, but we also talked about muddy areas are good to leave in your garden so that the osmia can build their nests with the mud in the in the bee blocks. So that's a quick little overview on on the habitat and what native bees like. And so I have a question. Would you list the nature plants you just met, mentioned? And um, I did talk about goldenrod, um, which is called um, uh, solidago. There's a tall variety that's native. There's a, sh a short dwarf variety called golden baby. And they just love it. The bees just love that. There you go, solidago. Um, yeah, the larkspur, um, the blanket flower, which is called uh, Gylardia aristata, that's a native. Um, other plants that they, the bees love are, are native penstemons and um, 
bee balm. It's called Monarda. And we have a native bee balm um, that is a light purple. That's a beautiful plant. Um, flowering plums. plums and Teresa, do, you mention, do you want to mention the, the plant list on our website? Right. If you go to our website um, at beechigas.com, we do have all of these plants on a plant list. And Xerces Society is also a good resource for natives in Colorado. Yeah. Great. Now we're going to uh, turn it over to Tracy and Deborah, and they're going to talk to you a little bit about bee houses. So Teresa gave you a beautiful tour through Cynthia's garden and all the lovely natural habitat that native bees will use. If you have plants with pithy stems or sunflower stalks or joe pie weed, all of those things will be natural homes for native bees that are cavity dwelling. If you actually want to provide some housing, here's some samples of what different bee houses could look like. Um, they come in a wide variety anything from homemade like the drilled block in the lower left and the sweet little bee house that Tracy's putting on the library wall um, to the straws that Cynthia men mentioned for mason bees. Um, the nice thing about the drilled blocks is that you'll attract, if you use different size holes, you'll attract yeah. many different species of bees. And so it gives you a wide variety of bees to, to watch and interact with. Yeah, and um, if you don't want to make your own, Costco actually had a beautiful bee house. It's the one in the center with the sort of reddish peaked roof mm -hmm. that was the appropriate dimension. And that's one thing you do want to look out for when you buy uh, bee houses is to make sure they're at least, Tracy, is it five inches long? Yeah, five inches in depth. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And Costco, and, I, I did call them to see if they had them yet, and they don't have them this oh, year, or at least not yet. Um, but I bought a bunch and gave them to all my friends last year, and it's it's um, something I want to yeah. do again. But notice the size of the holes on the top left. They're all uniform, mm -hmm. and they have mud plugs. So if you remember what Cynthia said about the Blue Orchard Mason Bee, that's really specific to attracting that blue orchard mason bee. Yes, as are those bamboo um, stems in the side of the Costco house. Yeah, they're larger. So yep. anything, anything from one eighth of an inch to I would say like three eighths, a uh, half inch is a little large. Um, so we're scaling it up now. <laughs> this is something we'd love to see more of uh, in, in our communities uh, in, in the United States. Uh, and traveling by bike in France, you see these on the bike paths even. And um, in every second village, I, I saw them a couple years ago. Um, the one on the left uh, was a Boy Scout um, construction. And um, in Denver and um, or Denver Botanic Gardens, I, I can't remember, but it was a Boy Scout one. And then here we have our um, our um, hotel at the library, and you can see Cynthia and Deborah in their colorful suits in front of it. And, and we're one thing we should mention about these is the um, the grating we did on the outside of the beehive right. to keep the birds yeah. out. Yep. Yeah. What are you guys looking at, by the way? You're, we're always looking at this hotel. Oh my gosh. Beautiful little insects flying in and out. That was a busy oh, day. Sweat bees were going everywhere, in and yeah. out. And then that middle uh, bucket is in Cynthia's garden, and those are a bunch of reeds. Is that Joe Pye weed, Cynthia? But th they're perfect reeds for uh, native bees. And you, you could put it on its side, too. Yep. Yeah, the library was super busy that day. It had some good habitat. Uh, so here we're looking at a bumblebee nest and um, the one on the left looks just like the one in, I, I found in our neighbor's lawn chair. It liked the stuffing inside of her outdoor patio furniture, I guess. And there were springs and cotton stuffing and then all these like clay, not clay, sorry, wax pots in between um, the, the, the fluff. Um, and 
you can try to attract them. They're, they, they're really picky about where they want to live, build nest, even in the side of our house, there's a, there's a big enough hole for them to, to get in and find a cavity about a shoebox size. So you can bury a shoebox size box in the ground and then an angled entrance so that water doesn't just dr drain into the box. And then a bunch of like uh, wool stuffing or cotton fibers uh, and hopefully you can attract them. And um, I think Teresa mentioned when she showed you um, the videos the how important it is to leave bare ground in your garden. It's sort of contrary because in, in dry climates, we want to mulch everything and conserve water, but bees actually need bare ground. And even, um, even in your garden pathways between flagstone pavers, I have... Um, I have bees and wasps that nest between the pavers on my back patio. And so they'll find it if you leave it for them. But um, it's super it's super important to have areas and maybe out of traffic areas. I'm not really sure why they're doing that on my patio because we walk back and forth all the time. But yeah. find some out of the way patches and, and leave it available to them. Like, especially for like alkali, alkali bees and the mining bees and those sweat bees, they love to nest in the ground. And um, those mining bees are great for, the alkali bees are great for like onions. So farmers who grow onions will leave huge swaths of bare ground just for their pollinators. And, and if you like like nicely formed strawberries, you have like those little tiny sweat bees to thank uh, because they're small enough that they can get to each pistil in the flower. And um, whereas honeybees can't do that same job. So those, you know, if you want to have nice fruit in your garden, leave some bare patches. Yep. And just quickly, um, sometimes your bee blocks will split. And that's what happens bee blocks from the citizen science um, study that we all did through CU and I noticed that they were splitting and, and really the signal to me was I just didn't have as many nesting bees so I knew they weren't as attractive and one way you can replace them since they plug them up and they go over the winter you it's hard to time it you can put it under an emergence bucket or an emergence box cut a hole that's about an inch wide and make sure the hole faces the sun. And you want to do that in the earliest part of the season in March. And you stick your block, I put a picture there so you could see the block under the bucket, push it to the back so there's lots of space at the front of the block before you hit the bucket. And then as the bees emerge throughout the season, they'll see that little bright sunlit hole and they will fly out. And since they prefer to nest in sunny places, they won't go back into a dark bucket to nest. They'll go to the new block that you've already put out to replace it. And so how around you know, September, I could take the block out and it was completely empty of bees and they'd all re-nested in the new block I put out. Okay, how old was the block before you decided to replace it? It was falling apart because of like sun and I, I would say, oh, it was probably five years old. Okay. Yeah, there's some concern on the East Coast uh, where it's more humid, um, the pollen mites, and um, and then more parasitic wasps. Uh, but here in Colorado, it hasn't been an issue for that seven-year bees yeah. need study with the CU Muse Museum. So Deborah's replacing it just because it was kind of falling apart and cracked. And probably there's old cocoons in there and other like plug debris. Yeah, and I would say if you start to notice that you have less nesting plugs and it's being visited less, maybe it's time to swap it out. Tracy, yeah. Deborah, can you show us a, a homemade a nesting site for oh, yes. our native yeah. bees? We, we have a couple of different designs. That's Cynthia's. Want to talk about how your plugs are filled with mason bees? I just wanted to say that this, so if you go on our website, there's a detailed um, video. There's two different detailed videos on how to make your own native bee house, which we showed last year. And this is the one that I made last year during this class. And I put it out and you can see I've got at least three mason bees with their mud plugs nesting in there that I just took this out of the tree. I'm going to put it back outside. 
And then there's one little one with a tiny hole in it that either maybe a nomia or some kind of parasitic bee got in there and laid its its eggs in there, or it could be it could be an emergence. I'm not sure, but it's so fun just to look after a year to see what's in here. And you don't need to refresh your bee house um, every year. You can just leave it there for a while, and then after you're it's been there for three to three to five years, then you can do a process like Deborah's talking about to clear out your bee house. But Sin, I want you to remind people that it can just be the simple cardboard roof, which was perfect. Yeah. Yeah. You or can use supplies from home. It's it's falling. I mean, it's it's still doing its job. Yeah, it's getting shade and it's um it's keeping the snow off. But I, it snowed a lot on top of this roof. And it's still doing its job. So, um, yeah, it's it's a you don't have to have a fancy house. Yeah. Some other some other materials that you might use um, could be as simple as like uh, a neighbor likes to drink these bottled things of uh, water, and then you can cut off the top and just plug it with straws. And shade is important, as Cynthia mentioned. So you might um, put some twine on this and then tie it under a branch or an eaves. It, they like to get morning sun. So these straws are movable in here. So you can replace the straws. They're just paper straws. But these are official mason bee tubes that you can purchase from Crown, Crown Bees and Harlequin's Gardens. And it's important if you wanna like help restore our mason bee population. Last year we had a really late frost uh, freeze in May. And I'm even amazed that Cynthia had two mason bee uh, straws that were filled because Tom Theobald, who tries to um, raise mason bees to sell, had none to sell this year uh, because of that um, May freeze. I think the females emerged from their, um, their, their tubes uh, and had about five days to lay eggs and then the, the cold hit and he lost his population that's gonna take about three years to, to, to bring back to what he, where he can actually sell extra straws. So those are really valuable straws that you have, Cynthia, with the Mason B um, uh, plugs, so. And that's a good point that you bring up also, Tracy, is that your first year that you put out your bee house, you might not, you might get some, you might not. Make sure you put it out in um, mid to late March um, because you never know when they're gonna start emerging. Put it near a um, flowering fruit tree if you're trying to get the orchard mason bees. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then be patient. If you don't get many the first year, just leave it. And then you might, if you get one straw, then the next year you're gonna have 10 straws. So. I I don't think if we mentioned, but um, they, I don't remember if we, they emerge in the spring with the spring blossoms, like fruit trees, they're orchard bees. I know you said that, but they only survive for about a month. And Tom Theobald's concern was that the, um, the females only maybe had time to fill the bottom of their cavity and, and then cap it off in the middle. And then maybe the rest of the, the tube might've got filled with, um, Leaf cutters, leaf cutters are a later. Um, they're also the same, kind of the same year cycle, um, living most of their life as pupa and coming out in like late June and pollinating all your sunflowers. But anyway, so it's a good idea to use the paper plugs or the paper liners so you can pull them out maybe and just be a better, I mean, the be a better guardian for these mason bees and you can extend the season if you want to avoid that late freeze you can extend the season by putting them in the fridge these um, cocoons and straws also a Teresa Habercorn just asked the question what what maintaining or cleaning out of, uh, on a bee house or are we protecting them from parasitic wasps and actually we kind of are working with the whole ecosystem. So we're not really protecting them from parasitic wasps. It's part of the game. You know, the spiders, the parasitic wasps, they're going to be there. But as far as cleaning out a bee house, sometimes um, there are diseases that bees can get, native bees. And so that's a good reason to switch it over. But also, as Deborah mentioned, the splitting and the, um, you know, the wood gets old. It's just good to refresh. Um, Bichikas, do you have any other uh, input on that? Oh, 
I think just because our climate's so dry here. I mean, you hear a lot about, um, you know, bamboo is horrible because it molds or, you know, it, it retains moisture. And for a while, the bee blocks were, um, you know, sort of thought to be terrible. I think really anything that's poorly managed is a problem. So if you see something that looks like it's gotten wet or damp, replace it. You know, just like I said, if you notice that, I mean, the bees want a clean home, so they will always prefer something clean and neat. And um, if you're noticing that you have less nesting activity, maybe it's just time to change out your bee house. And the yeah. mason bee straws do require a specific kind of maintenance. We didn't really go into specifics on that. It might be on our website, um, but I just have blocks. I don't do mason bee straws because um, that's more, more work than I wanna put into it. I put blocks out and I let whatever bees wanna come, come, and I just let that natural cycle take care of itself. So mm -hmm. there's so many different ways you can engage with this and you could just plant native plants and let the bees do what they do. I want to say one thing about habitat because I didn't mention this in my habitat talk, but bee walls, I mean, any kind of stone walls that has yeah. little cavities, uh, bees will nest in there. So look at your garden walls and your the stone walls and pavements. You may see bees going in and out. I know on our front porch, I have nesting um, bumbles that go down into a little hole uh, right by the wood and between the wood and the stone. So just keep an eye out. So so we have a question. Uh, oh, Cynthia? I was just going to say that these are um, reeds that I have from the garden that I've cut up. But if you don't want to maintain a bee house, just leave these growing in your yes. garden. And if you have to cut them down, like if I'm cutting them down right now, they are not dry yet, perhaps. Ooh. So I need to leave them for a season like piled in the side of my yard so that I have habitat for the bees because just leaving it over one season you're not going to have it dried it'll you'll have stems that still have pith in them that some bees will chew it out but um, most bees like to have a nice round open hole like this and so so if you let nature do it and you want to just observe, then that's that's the easiest way to yeah. do that. Um, Ma Mandy, we can answer your question. Um, you can leave the bee houses out all winter. Uh, my dad made the mistake of bringing them inside of the house uh, for w for winter. They need they need the cold period, and um, you can put them in an unheated shed and then bring to protect them from predators like woodpeckers um, and then bring them out, you know, before the blossoms or when, when things are, when trees start blossoming. But I wanted to say these um, bamboo straws are from McGuckins. And, um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is I'm going to hang this by my kitchen window. So when I'm um, doing dishes or I'm at the, I'm at, in the kitchen, I can see who's coming and going. I think it's a wonderful thing for kids to hang one outside of their window, um, maybe east facing so they don't, and, and then protection from the late sun. But um, it's a great opportunity to observe. But if there is a deep freeze like last spring, you can bring in your straws and put them in a paper bag and put, put them in your crisper where you keep your vegetables just until that cold spell passes and then put them back outside. Yeah. That would be, yeah, because the reason you would do that is, um, right, Teresa, is that if the fruit trees aren't blooming when they come out or if you get a deep freeze that's coming up, you want to protect your bees so they exactly. don't. Exactly, yeah. yes. And so what happens if they come out, if there is a late frost, what happens to the to the bees if, if the fruit trees or other things are no longer available? It's a tough spring. We had that last spring. It yeah. was hard. It was hard because the, the fruit trees are the biggest nectar flow in the spring. Way, you know, way more food available through fruit trees than garden flowers. So there was a real dearth. There was a real nectar dearth for um, pollinators we, last spring. I think, and we were thankful for the dandelions. They, they oh. withstood the frost, didn't they? 
Or oh, they did. And Teresa mentioned the dandelions. They should be the state, the second state flower. Because <laughs> we love Columbine. But the dandelions are so important. If that's the only thing you do, which is grow a dandelion lawn, it's one of the best things you can do to support pollinators. And and Tracy, I think you mentioned Tom Theobald's um, mason bee concerns about mason bees this year because we had such an early freeze last year. Can you talk about what we can do to help support some of the native bees, especially because either we have an early an early frost or a late frost? Yeah, um, Tom Theobald's message right now is to get everybody putting up um, straws that are mason bee size and try and support the the few survivors that and try to establish a, a new population. Um, purchasing mason bees isn't a good idea unless they're local Colorado mason bees. You can order them online, um, but we don't want to introduce non-native mason bees that might compete with ours. Any, any other thoughts on, on how to support, like, I think putting up the bee houses and planting forage, for sure. And when we uh, recommend planting forage, of course, we're recommending no pesticides. So no nic nicotinoids and go to the garden centers at, that in the area, our local area, like Harlequin Gardens, um, uh, Flower Bin, McGuckin sells uh, no neonics on their plants. So just source, source your plants so that uh, you don't have pesticides. And specifically for the mason bees, as um, Cynthia mentioned, they come out early. I mean, they will emerge in March. So we're talking about very, very, very early spring forage. So whatever you can plant that, that will bloom in the earliest part of the season will help support that bee specifically. Wild plants. And if you want to support the native bees, plant native plants is a very, very key important thing. Because, uh, some of the bees are specialists on native plants um, and they've evolved together with yeah. them. And, um, and sort of like Doug Tallamy would say, he's a, a great naturalist and he um, is trying to get everyone to plant native plants in their yards and then we'll have a whole national park made up of everyone's backyards and that will truly support the native bees and the, all the mm -hmm. pollinators and all of the birds and on up the, the chain. So try to create an ecosystem from the soil to the treetops that's healthy and happy for the critters that live out there. And what a perfect yeah. lead in to our April workshop. <laughs> So oh, we can, yeah, we can quickly talk about that. And I have a question for Cynthia. So the, the workshop that will be next, um, Cynthia, do you want to explain what that one's about? Oops. Oh, sorry. Oh, sure. Yeah, we're going to be talking about gardening for the birds and the bees in April. So it's just going to be an extension, a uh, little bit of uh, what we, at Teresa sort of alluded to. And we're going to talk specifically about um, plants and how they support entire ecosystems, including all of the bugs that feed the, the birds and things like if you want butterflies in your yard, you have to have the host plant for the caterpillar and that kind of thing. So, And we're even going to talk about the microorganisms in the soil and how to build healthy soil. Mm -hmm. Like Great. It's, a, it's a whole food web in, in our community. That yeah. we're and to love support. your bugs, basically, is the and theme of that. Deborah, do native bees need both nectar and pollen? They do. They do. They use both. They don't put up honey, as we said, like honeybees do, but um, they use both as a food source. Yeah, and when you're looking at when you're looking at flowers, it's it's all the bugs like all wasps, beetles, flies all love to drink nectar, but it's only bees that will collect pollen for their protein source. Mm -hmm. um, Cynthia, do you want to address Allison's question? What is harmful for the bees that you don't want to use? So harmful. The biggest harm that you can do is to put any kind of pesticides in your yard. Uh, because pest aside means killing pests. And I don't think of any of the, of the bugs in my yard as pests. So 
I would eliminate that. And I would, um, I think that's the biggest thing that the most harmful thing for our bees um, is the pesticides. Thank you. Deborah, can you, can you talk about um, why a beekeeper would, a honey beekeeper would build a native bee house? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I have a ton of natural habitat in my garden. I, I mean, I've got um, lots of areas where bees will nest naturally. I put native bee houses up because I want to see them. Because when they nest in my blocks, uh, so just like Tracy said, putting it outside of her window, you can see them nesting, you can watch them more easily, I can more easily identify the different kinds of bees I have in my garden. And it's just another layer of support for the bees, but it's a really great way for me to engage. Thank you. And as the last question, um, Teresa, can you talk about how the Native Bee House came together at the library? Oh, that was so much fun. We did, we did a workshop and uh, it was over two uh, sessions um, and built the frame. We had a friend that's a carpenter and he uh, we designed it with Will and he uh, helped us put the outside together. Then we had all these kids and parents and um, uh, collect things like the reeds and the bamboo and blocks and drilled. And Adrian Carper from CU came to oversee it with us and he had so much great information And because there's different sizes for the cavities and they have to be at least six inches long so that the queens can lay the females at the back, you know, and not just have males. So six to eight inches long. So there's some parameters around building it, but um, we kind of like the individual bee houses instead of building a huge um, hotel for the homeowner, it's a little harder to maintain a hotel than it is just a smaller bee block. Um, but that was really fun. But the big hotel is such a great education tool because we put it right on the creek path, right yes. outside of the library, um, the children's play area. So, you know, a lot of people that have no idea what a native bee is can walk by and boom, you know. And see them buzzing around. And they're actually very gentle. They don't sting. So you can be right up there like Cynthia and Deborah were watching these sweat bees go in and out and uh, they weren't getting stung. So it's, it's a very... Um, easy house to have bees in a garden, especially with children. Thank you. Chicas, any last words before we close? Just, just pay attention to what's flying around you. Mm -hmm. If nothing else, you'll start to see things you didn't even know existed after this. Nicely said, thank you. So this yeah, concludes, you. oh. <laughs> Sorry, Tracy. So this concludes oh, just, our native <laughs> our native bee workshop with the bee chicas. And I want to thank Teresa Beck, Cynthia Scott, Tracy Bellhumer, and Deborah Foy for educating us on how we can support pollinators, how we can be more creative with how we engage with the environment and ways that we can support a healthier habitat for the smallest creatures that will um, also help all creatures. Thank you, Shannon and the Boulder Library Foundation, along with everyone else who tuned in to watch and also who asked questions. And I invite you, as we mentioned previously, to attend our next workshop. And that is the Bee Chicas will be talking about gardening for birds and the bees. And we invite you to come uh, attend that. We'll also have some Instagram posts where you can ask your questions ahead of time. So the, our master gardener, Bee Chicas, can um, form some of those answers for you. We are, if you enjoy any, if you know anyone else who would enjoy this event, this session has been recorded and will be available to watch on the Boulder Public Library's Seed to Table YouTube playlist. Visit boulderlibrary.org Seed to Table website for upcoming programs. And thank you so much for joining us.